to do, I think, with what they are sort of naturally exposed to as opposed to what they're not. Because um, we've been talking about things that I think social argumentation is there. It's a familial thing. It's a thing that you do. I, you know, when my younger son was very young, uh, he wanted me to, to tell him stories about my life before bed. And a lot of times I was really busy and it was late. And I wanted to get him to bed quickly. And so I would say, OK, I'm going to tell you a story about when I was a little boy. One day I got up and I had breakfast, you know, Cheerios. Um, I climbed my favorite tree. I went in. I had lunch, um, <laughs> you know, grilled cheese sandwich. I went out again. I played in the yard. I went in. I had dinner, spaghetti and meatballs. I read a book and I went to bed. The end. <laughs> And he, and he got so frustrated. And I said, I told you a story about when I was a little boy. And he said, it's not a story. It's not a story. And so then I thought, OK, I'm going to play with this a little bit. What makes a good story? Of course, he didn't use the kinds of terms that we would. But he, know, he knew what a good, good stories have certain kinds of structures and certain complications. And they have resolution. So at the age of about four or five, he knew what a good story was. And so I think a lot of students, all students have lots and lots of discourse knowledge. But what, what is the discourse? What have they not been exposed to? What kinds of tech? And this is an issue when you look at um, elementary education. There's such a focus on imaginative um, written discourse. There's such a focus on storytelling, and much less on other kinds of genre. I mean, kids don't read. They don't get exposed to scientific articles and op-eds and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they wouldn't, if you gave them a bad one, they wouldn't say, that's not a good op-ed. You know, they, they just don't, <laughs> right? I mean, they don't have that. So, so one thing I think we have to think about is what students are exposed to as a matter of course, um, which I think will be amenable to some kind of transfer if we make it explicit enough. And what are, what are they, they never exposed to that we need to expose them to? So that's, that's one issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about I thought Nancy said something interesting about, um, you know, about this notion of engagement on a, on a response level. And I think we ought to think about that on a curricular level. Um, because we, we're so used, particularly in writing programs, we're so used to giving students assignments that are completely disconnected from each other every two weeks. We expect them to do brilliant things with no knowledge at all. You know, they're supposed to write great, make great arguments and make cases with no chance to really immerse themselves in the stuff that they're writing about. And it, and it brings to mind some work that David Jolliffe did many years ago on the sort of inquiry-guided learning, um, where students would, would choose something. They'd spend a lot of time choosing something that, was, that they really were passionate about learning. And then they would spend the entire course just immersed in that question. And they'd spin off different kinds of texts and different genres from that. Um, and he said that by the end of the course, they were writing with so much more authority um, and confidence and depth about these topics because they weren't facing a new topic every two weeks. Mm. That's another thing I think we need to think about is to what extent we're really giving students unreasonable kinds of tasks you know, that, that don't allow them to, to know what we, we write about things we know about, and we often don't give them the mm. chance to really know something to write about it effectively. So those are yeah. two thoughts. Mm -hmm. I uh, can add something to that, I, I think. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in addition to uh, uh, giving students unfamiliar kinds of text, there are certain very familiar texts that they encounter all the time and never really read. Uh, and a lot of these are the texts I call sacred texts, uh, political sacred texts, uh, uh, religious sacred texts. Uh, uh, you know, if you, if you just get your sacred text uh, uh, in, in a certain place, if you get your religious sacred text always being interpreted for you by, by, by some minister or, or priest, you probably have never really read that sacred, uh, that sacred text. And uh, I think that uh, using the kinds of skills that we develop with the literary text and turning them on the sacred text can be a very exciting thing. Take a simple example. Uh, God, 
appears and says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Question, does God think there are no other gods or does God think there are other gods and he just wants to be the first in line? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I think that reading these things, really reading these things and reading what is not said as well as what is said, you know, when, when you're told that you shall not covet uh, thy, thy neighbor's wife or his ox or his ass uh, or his maidservant or his manservant. There's nothing in there about not coveting husbands. You know, why not? Because husbands are the coveters. They're the owners. You know? and, and if you, if, you, if you read those texts and don't read what isn't being said, you'll never understand what sort of uh, creature this God is. Of course, cre he's not a creature. He's a creator, right? But the, you know what I mean. Uh, what sort of creator this God is then? Uh, put it that way. I, I think that, that putting these sacred texts, putting the Second Amendment, uh, putting the 14th Amendment, putting these things out there and saying, let's really read them. Let's read them with all of the intensity and skill that we develop uh, from looking at other kinds of, other kinds of texts. Uh, I think that can be uh, very exciting if we have the courage to do that. You know, uh, sacred texts have, have uh, a certain problem. Uh, and uh, my own theory of reading is a three-part theory. There's first of all, and I, and I like to explain this to students and say, for the text we're going to look at, we're going to do it in three stages. First stage, reacting. Just immediate response. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you, do you, uh, do you agree with it? Not agree with it? Second stage, where is it coming from? Uh, what, uh, what did it mean to the person or persons who created it? Uh, can we go back to that stage, back to, as, as Auden says, them, there, then? Uh, go back to them, there, then, and, and ask what it, what it meant to them. And then the third stage, criticism, say, okay, if it meant that to them, there, then, what does it mean to us here now, and do we want to accept that if, if we think that... Uh, uh, that uh, God seems to be a man speaking to other men uh, and that women are dealt with as property there, do we, do we, want, do, do we really want that religion? You know, uh, we need, uh, that, that's the critical stage. Uh, and I, th I think that uh, there's a lot that we can do to energize our classrooms by getting the sacred text in there. I mean, I also think we need to do profane texts in, in another way, but, but the sacred texts belong in in our curriculum, in, in the curriculum that studies reading and writing. That's a, that's a way of saying things are more complicated than they seem. <laughs> 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 Which I think, I think ought to be a template for every politician before they run for office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that, by the way, I, uh, uh, just Nancy, I, I understand that it's, it certainly can be irritating when students uh, take a, a formula like that complication formula and sort of beat it to death. But I have to say that I, we're teaching a lot of students now. We wish they would do that. You know, we wish. So it's not the worst thing when students kind of turn our stuff into cliches. A lot of them don't know yet how to do that. It really brings me to, I, I was delighted that when uh, Jack Brereton uh, said, and I wrote down what he said, that the amount of mystification in academia is appalling. I don't think that can be said too strongly. I mean, um, yeah, I don't get the feeling that we act as if we worry, you know, we care about that that much, that it has much urgency uh, to us. And I think we should. But I think that when we do um, uh, uh, worry about the mystification in academia and how, um, uh, how unsuccessful we often are in getting, getting through to, um, to our students. We act as if it's a matter of individual teaching or of individual course strategy or even, and uh, Bob, I've earned the right to um, make this mild suggestion because I've taught your, we've taught your books for many oh, years. Yeah. You know, the best things around for teaching liter current advanced literary culture and making it clear to students who don't understand it, which is most, 
But you know, change, we could change the, uh, the subject matter and, and, and stress textuality much more than we now do. Deprivileged literature, privileged textuality, a lot of them still would be very confused. In fact, some might be more so because it's inherently hard, hard to think that way. And I think that to, and this goes back to our, our um, approach, you know, it seems to me we have to get beyond the level of individual teaching, individual courses, individual subject matter uh, to make a dent in this problem. We have to start thinking collectively on how the students see us as a collective body, uh, faculties or eggheads, uh, educated types. Um, the, the university still acts as if it's up to, to them to figure us out, and if they don't, it's their fault, you know, it's not our fault. Uh, we, we, assessment, I think, since somebody brought it up, is, uh, has the potential to change that situation because we have to start asking, well, how much of, how much of, of what we're putting out there is um, actually being learned? And then we have to think of we, because mm -hmm. assessment is not just about what I teach or what you teach or what I do in my course, I always like to say, it's about what kind of sense they make uh, of us. And, and that's, that's why um, Kathy and I, I think, try to focus on um, the totality that's, that's coming across to them and why the, the question of mixed messages and commonality, it seems to me, becomes important. Any comments from the audience? Please come on up to the... Uh, <laughs> you have to get to a microphone. I yeah. bet everybody can hear my voice. No, but yeah. but the, but the video won't. Oh, well, <laughs> I want to uh, make a comment on behalf of your son's need for a story. <laughs> I think uh, it's very important for children to internalize the stories because that's how they develop their stories. Mm -hmm. And I remember stories that I read in grade school that I have never forgotten about personal bravery or compassion. And I think that's the way children build. So I say hats off mm -hmm. to your boy. <laughs> Any other comments? If not, I'm going to declare the session adjourned and people can try to avoid the snowstorm. <laughs>